I got it actually. Okay, beautiful. Thanks folks. Welcome to June 24th, Hyperledger Supply Chain Special Interest Group uh, session on impact tokenization with uh, Johannes Pulfort from the uh, University in Vienna. Econ it was an economic university in Vienna. Is that more right, Johannes? Correct, yeah. Vienna University okay. of Economics and Business. There you go. And I'll let him talk a little bit more. Um, so before we get going with Johannes, uh, here a couple things I put in the chat. Uh, the Hyperledger antitrust policy, we're open here. We want to have all, all opinions valued. Um, things that you share are part of the open world there. So don't share any proprietary information that you don't want out there. Um, and you can read it at your, at your leisure. Also uh, in the chat, you can see a link there for, uh, from Daniela that has uh, all the link to all of the global forum for a couple of weeks ago, the sessions that are now up on YouTube. And there'll be an email going out later today, but if you uh, are anxious and wanna see them all now, there's a link to uh, access lots of good presentations. Um, at least when I attended it a couple of weeks ago there, and I'm looking forward to seeing some of the ones that I couldn't see at the same time there. So, uh, and then one other thing here, we have two small projects going with our group, one around uh, cataloging use cases for supply chain, and they're getting ready to send out a survey, that group there. So they've been meeting weekly over the last few weeks. So look for something there. And let's see, I've had a couple calls here with the RFI small project where let's try to come up with uh, some set of questions and it'll probably be focused more around logistics with a little bit around trade finance and a little bit around sustainability. And we're gonna tr we'll try to maybe do something with the climate action group as well as the trade finance group here. So look for a little bit more there. Always looking for more volunteers. If you like to participate in one of these uh, together with the leaders, that would be great. So with that, let's move on to our presenter here. Uh, fun fact with Johannes uh, here, he played tennis on scholarship at the University of South Carolina. So he's a Gamecock. And also, if you ever want to talk tennis, you can talk tennis. But today, he's going to talk about uh, a project that he's been working on for a, a few years here. Actually, it was funded by the UN Food and Agriculture Organization out of Rome. Uh, I became aware of it, and I was interested. I thought it'd be valuable because there's been an increasing interest in tokenization. Um, be in the hyperledger community. And so he's done some work associated with token, tokenization and specifically in agricultural supply chain. So I thought it'd be good for Johannes to share with us some of his thoughts and hopefully they can spark uh, further thoughts in each one of us on the individual projects that we're working on or group projects that we're working on. So with that, Johannes, I will turn it over to you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm delighted to be here. My name is Johannes Pulsford. I'm actually a doctoral candidate here at the Vienna University of Economics and Research. And in the last couple of years, I've been focusing mainly in my research on blockchain and supply chains. That is by nature a very broad topic. Nevertheless, I broke it down to three supply chains in my research. One is uh, agricultural supply chain, which you will um, see today. Um, the second one is about plastic supply chains and circular plastic supply chains. And the third one is around automotive supply chain and logistics. And as I said today, I will focus on the agriculture supply chains. So the topic of my talk, of my research talk, will be impact tokenization and innovative financial models for responsible agriculture supply chains. This research has been done directly for the United Nations FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization. Their headquarters is in Rome, and they are very much looking forward to also contributing and uh, helping to uh, actually solve the or um, reach the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and I will come to that later. Um, yeah, that's my the story of today, and that's also my background. And uh, of course, I also work for um, other startups or, or research agencies next to my PhD. And uh, I'm happy to talk about that also after the talk. Um, so the agenda for the today will be the purpose of the research paper, 
the key research findings that we got from expert interviews. We interviewed over 24 experts from around the world and for the topics of blockchain, um, so agriculture supply chains and impact investment models. And the second part or the second topic is event tokenization and impact measurement and verification in the agriculture supply chain. Then how to monetize tokenized impact as an investment. What kind of results do we get? What kind of recommendations can we give? And uh, then we can also get, dive into questions and answers. Hopefully I can answer your questions. At least I will try. So the purpose of the paper was actually directly, as I said, from the United Nations. They asked us to do a research uh, on agriculture supply chains and Basically here, you see that we base our research on the guidelines or guidance of the OECD FAO for responsible agriculture supply chains. This document is actually a blueprint of how responsible agriculture supply chains should be um, done in the future. And our model is then of course to um, combine tokenization and impact investment models in order to actually enhance these guidelines and actually move towards the real realization of them uh, by the means of technology and finance. So as you can see here, the purpose is clearly to show how, to, um, how these new forms of impact measurement and verification and tokenization can be leveraged to test innovative financial model that, models that incentivize more responsible agriculture supply chains. So there's a plethora of um, issues and problems associated with agricultural supply chains on a global scale. And we try to address them with these uh, new, uh, let's say, tools. Um, so basically what we find from the, from the expert interviews, we've done around 24 expert interviews with experts from a blockchain and tokenization, but also from impact investment models and the agriculture supply chain. And we tried to come up uh, out of those 24 expert interviews, which lasted up to 90 minutes each. Um, that's a lot of, let's say, qualitative um, information that we got. And we tried to summarize it in three key, key research findings that we found out. And the first one being the performance-based financial models where payments are dependent on measurable impact targets. So really, uh, connecting um, impact targets uh, with payments provides significant opportunity to generate both impact and financial return for investors and can attract a larger pool of impact first investors. I will get into the details of what it actually means later on, but that as a guidance for, for what you should be listening or why you should be listening to me, um, this is really combining financial models and really making sure that these financial models are not only looking at financial returns, but at impact returns. And that's uh, gonna be actually the currency of the future if you ask me personally, because we are gonna have a big, or we, we are having big issues coming up like climate change, plastic pollution, but also actually the um, agriculture supply chain is gonna be affected by the climate change. Um, second point here, is very much around the advancements in technology. So um, having a, yeah, that you can have real-time scalable impact measurement and verification in the agriculture supply chain, which then can unlock innovative performance-based financial models. So it's the data layer. And of course it's blockchain that is able to do such a, such a real-time and scalable impact measurement um, because it can record data in near real time for the, the different participants in, uh, in an agriculture supply chain. And the third one is, of course, the ideal blockchain based agriculture supply chain solutions that are fit into existing financial frameworks, complementing current free market incentive structures and are managed with strong governance practices. So here also the dimension of strategic governance comes into play. What is out there currently? How can we use it? How can we leverage and actually enhance it through blockchain? And how can we use the technology in combination with the financial work, the frameworks in order to promote responsible agriculture supply chains in the future? So these kind of three, if, if you stop listening now and you got only these three points from me, um, that's 
uh, let's say on a high level, all you should remember. But of course, the details also matter. And especially in research, uh, we also dig much deeper. But this is kind of, let's say, the executive summary. And I, of course, encourage you to keep on listening and, and try to learn more about these subjects, as I think they are very important also or interesting, I hope, to you. So what is event tokenization and what is impact measurement and what does it mean to verify that in an agriculture supply chain? So based on a typical supply chain that we have for agriculture, uh, you have the supplier, the producer, the processor, the distributor, the custom, the retailer, the consumer. And in the end, the consumer mostly doesn't know what's actually where the food is com coming from what has, has been uh, done to the food, was it raised biologically, you have some certificates around, but you never know if you couldn't trust these certificates. And with a blockchain based solution, you actually start to implement a very much data driven um, approach. And we want to tokenize these events along the, uh, along the processes and, and the steps and measure the impact and verify it. So then we might have, for example, the, the supplier who is actually um, saying, okay, here's the agriculture and livestock inputs, which are then sold to producers and registered on a, on a blockchain solution or DLT, distributed ledger technology. Um, for X, you could try to enter the data. Then the producer is actually tagging also the, the single X or at least the carton above it um, in order to make sure that this data point then can travel along with the, with the good. Then the processor and, and the government also needs to inspect the data and see, okay, is this egg or chicken or whatever poultry product you have, is it actually uh, living up to the compliance and, and, the, and the rules that we have set up? Uh, the distributor wants to maybe show that, okay, the, the way the product is traveled, uh, it, it always had a certain temperature and it was always safe. It was always um, measuring the conditions. The customs can see, okay, is this all done correctly? Are the certificates in place? And the retailer then, of course, can, can say, okay, um, maybe it's hot, then less eggs are, are used, or maybe if it's less hot, more eggs are used to so real-time forecasting of how to see the demand, because you now have data input, and you can actually also try to model when do you need a certain product in which store. So actually also... Um, breaks, uh, breaks the room for, for, for AI. And of course, the consumer in the end wants to know where's the product coming from? How can I get a, a complete uh, history of the product? And that in the end can be done via a QR code, which is then attached to the final product, which is um, um, can be seen by the consumer and just scanned by, by a regular smartphone. Um, uh, yeah, I think in this group, I don't need to explain what blockchain is and DLT just very quickly uh, it's it's a way of, 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 of also tokenizing data and making sure that you can actually store it I will not spend so much time on this one but rather focus on tokenization so basically tokenization means um, that we can try to bring in the data points from individual events and then we verify this uh, events based on the data points that is basically needed to, to create a token. And for it to be minted into an impact event token, it needs to run through a burden of proof. It needs to show that it's actually true. And I will show the models behind that later. But just here as a high level, um, let's say mind map, um, if, if the token or if the data points do not match the criteria, it will not be verified and then actually goes to the trash. And the tokenization on individual events provides actually the foundation for impact investment models or for these innovative financing models. Um, yeah, so event triggered performance based tokens function on smart contracts. So let's assume there's an investor. And this investor wants to say, I invest in ESG criteria or impact criteria, which is defined. Then he will put in the money into a smart contract, uh, which is connected to a scrow account. Then the implementer and seller uh, needs to show that the event actually serves the right data points. Only if the event is verified, this information gets uh, locked into the smart contract. And then only then, the smart contract gets actually executed and 
uh, also takes in the event verification data and this impact event token is uh, is actually um, minted. Yeah, and then this uh, token then can be re reassessed or redistributed to the investor who then can show to his um stakeholders okay look i have these tokens these tokens have these data points and i've invested the sum x and uh, i've made this impact and it can be done on a very individual basis and even also then accumulated but you can go down to the uh, smallest uh, detail and data level which makes sense and uh, of course traditionally impact financing was more like of a black box so as an investor, you give money and then you get a nice report at the end of the year saying, yeah, thank you very much for your contribution. This is what we have done with your money, but you actually cannot probe and go into the details of it. And with our solution, with impact financing, with 100% impact attribution, we can actually um, link the outcome directly to the performance. So for example, you give money, you say, you, I want to... Um, only provide money to let's say the UN SDG number one, which is no poverty. And this money is actually just used for these kind of impact events. And that's actually the true beauty of blockchain and tokenization that you can break it down on such an individual level. And verified individual events, of course, then serve as a high level impact outcome. So the combination of let's say a thousand or 10,000 small events can have a substantial effect on UN SDGs or even globally. So it's also a scalable solution. And it means also that the investor or donor can show what is actually happening with, with the money. Yeah? So this is kind of the comparison. Um, blockchain serves as a tool for tracking and verification. So we start always at let's say, Point zero and say, okay, currently the system works in a centralized fashion. Um, you have market dominance by, by huge retailers. Maybe the, the small farmer doesn't get the money that, it, that he should get in order to also prosper and not have his kids work for, for, for his on his on his field, but rather go into education and actually develop um, moreover. And uh, blockchain creates for, for, for that transparency for the data points, so location, date, photos, confirmation codes, this all can be com combined. It's immutable because it's chained together the blocks of information so the data cannot be manipulated unless the community agrees and the change is public. And each token with the associated data is assigned to one owner, uh, to the person or organi organization who funded it. That makes also this ownership very important. And on the right-hand side, you see, of course, or you can do it, for example, for Ether or with the Ether scanner for Ethereum. You have a hash from a certain token that is attributed to the Ethereum blockchain. Normally, it's the ERC20 token, which is a token standard, um, which is then logging the, um, the data behind it. But you only see the hash. And then the hash, of course, contains the information that is, that is needed. Um, yeah, there's also... Uh, a meaningful output measures for, impo uh, for impact, the so-called IRIS catalog of, of metrics. And this uh, is very important in order to, for example, measure the right KPIs for the sustainable development goals. So for example, the average client agriculture yield, how, how much do you make per hectare uh, for, for, for a certain period of time? So the organization knows what's going on, what type of scale do we look at? And, and this is very important because it makes it measurable and you can then say the impact of my investment is some, or I invest some X and the impact is Y. So it, it makes it very, very uh, specific. Hey, Johannes, a quick question is Tom. Are you saying that this Iris Carolog of metrics is one of many and you just happen to pick this or you think this is a good one? Uh, we think that's a good one because it's uh, very internationally renowned in the impact uh, space. So I think if you use this IRIS catalog um, of metrics, you are on, a, on, a, on the safe side if you want to measure impact. Okay, good. Thank you. Any other questions out there? Just while I got a break, we got a break here. Folks want to ask Johannes on some of the token. By the way, Johannes, I did like the... Uh, the, how you'd explain exactly how 
the tokenization and smart contract exactly. It's probably the simplest chart I've seen. So <laughs> on that one. Yeah. Should I keep going or? Keep, keep going. Okay. Um, yeah, so data is proof of impact. So we know by, 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 by history, of course, with any data system, garbage in, garbage out is the main problem. And uh, of course, you can have humanized or over-humanized data, which is coming from multiple human-controlled mobile devices. And uh, an example of this would be mobile app data pulled in real time from multiple workers to confirm location. And the other extreme, let's say, is objective data coming from non-human sources, such as satellite images of farms, automated sensor data, IoT data, so really automated data. And I will show um, the difference of how it makes actually a, uh, there's a um, there's like a continuum of verification and the, the higher you or the, the more you go to the right end to end machine verification, the higher the value of the data point. And that will make sense in a couple of minutes when I will talk about the burden of proof, because with this methods for technology based data collection, we move from self reported events from human reporting, and you never know if you should trust that. Or you can take it as a data point, but maybe the value attached to it in, in weighting the average score is less than if it's an IoT generated data. So on the left hand side, you see the spectrum from basic technology to advanced technology, especially with regards to agriculture supply chain. So smart smartphones can, can shoot videos or photos to verify certain points, but then you have drones, satellites, IoT data, cross-referencing different data sources. So actually also triangulating data points to make sure that the data that is um, presented also is actually the truth and should be put into a token and then also be recorded on the blockchain in order to make sure that not false data is entered into the blockchain because then it becomes more, uh, or it becomes impossible to uh yeah edit that again or you it's very cumbersome yeah so this is very important to understand because um this continuum is um kind of also a way to to value the data quality and what does it mean for a supply chain farm to shelf um basically uh as, let's assume we have an iot so based supply chain which is then using the technology based data collection from the farm, so it can monitor the soil moisture, how much water was consumed, uh, leak detection, tracking of farm equipment, livestock tracking. So you can imagine uh, taking a constant video or a movement of the cows, and if the cow or if, if, if the livestock starts to uh, behave differently from the normal behavior, maybe it's sick or there's something going on. And, and, and you can directly intervene instead of just uh, measuring the impact um, and, 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 the, and the problems afterwards, but actually you can try to solve the problem at hand. Then farm to warehouse, of course, temperature monitoring, humidity monitoring, light, light exposure, location of the truck, when is the, the product, uh, then when is the produce moving from A to B to C and so on. The smart warehousing, again, tracking of equipment, water metering, service buttons, temperature, humidity, motion detection. What is maybe someone taking out something off the warehouse? Is there something going on, something fishy? So you can try to, to um, understand that the technology can serve as a, as a means to improve the overall supply chain. Um, with technology also, you can optimize the di distribution, you can optimize the routes, again, temperature monitoring, of the produce when it is uh, um, arriving at the final customer store on time delivery notification you can even think about smart contracts uh, being payment releases and so on so it actually can change the combination of iot and blockchain can um, uh, fundamentally transform the agriculture supply chain and i think that's uh, a, a, um, a good strategy to to aspire to and then of course this satisfied customer who, who pays in the end uh, doesn't doesn't have to have empty empty shelves for example if it's a grocery or retailer um, you can always make sure that you have enough pr uh, produce in your in your in your stocks uh, or in your shelves sorry 
and then of course also maintain the optimal temperature for, for products where temperature is very important, fridge power, customer satisfaction button. So make sure the end consumer also is happy with the way the information is presented, with the way um, the information is transparent and so on. And I think that's uh, very important here, of course, we need to take- Excuse uh, me, Johannes, can you go back to yeah. that slide? Go sure. back to, yeah. I, I'm looking like, for example, the on the farm stuff, why does that need to be on the blockchain? That seems the only person interested in that information is the farmer. Um, that could, uh, yeah, you can, you can be, uh, you can have this opinion that you say that the data which is um, on the farm is only relevant to the farmer, but perhaps also the end consumer wants to know the story of the product and the data points. So if it's not only the location, but also the farmer himself, his story, the data points from his farm. So it depends also on the scrutiny that the end consumer might have on how much information they want to have for the final produce. You can also assume as you indicate or imply in your, in your, in your, in your uh, response um, that uh, some, some consumers might not want to know so much detail, but then there's other consumers that they want to know every single detail and it's just a big variance again in the end consumer space. All right. Um, yeah, opportunities here, um, of course, with a blockchain and IoT based solution, you have real time information or near real time information available, you have much more granularity in your data, you have increased reliability and validity of the data we will come to that in the next slide how we can do that. Uh, we can lower the cost over time and increase efficiency and also um, one aspect is the entire topic of food waste and loss of products if you know more if you have more data then you can also um, improve that and not have so much uh, waste and loss of 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 um, material and of course in the beginning it's expensive to to set the system up it will require an upfront investment and perhaps this is also why investors are so important here because they can uh, provide the the necessary uh, incentives here in order to to do uh, such a project and a pilot perhaps it requires training yeah so you need to understand why is the solution actually good how can i do it how how is it uh, how is it beneficiary to to me as a farmer for example it requires perhaps a new workflow so disrupting the old the old structures and um, of course there's parts in the planet where we don't have proper internet access. So also this needs to be taken care of, but can be a good investment in the future because uh, it can make sense to connect um, remote places to the internet and whatever ramifications that can have for the local community. Um, now we will come to the impact verification with the increasing burden of proof. So burden of proof is basically a mathematical approach and I will show it later on in a more detailed slide, but this is high level. If you are not confident about the uh, data points below minimum threshold excluded from market, so the token will not be minted. A exclusion criteria could be does not pass the due diligence and the vetting criteria. Data only contains text from manual data collection. So again, this humanized data problem data fails verification checks so if you try to triangulate the data and someone says it was sunny and then reality google and satellite images show a huge uh, band of, of, of uh, rain then this cannot be true um, and then when we move towards completeness and uniqueness of the data points we have tailored cross-sectional and long longitudinal validation checks so this can be also automated we have enhanced validation through self-reported data, which is then cross-checked against independent external online sources, like I was saying, like oracles, which can then be implemented. Third-party human confirmation. So imagine like auditors coming in or other people independent from the, the producer, um, they confirm this uh, manually um, conducted uh, data from human verifiers. And then, of course, the best way to verify data or prove the data points is if you have machine-based confirmations, 
or a third party administered machine for data collection and verification say, okay, with the 99.5% confidence, we know this data point must be true because it has been uh, meeting all these criteria. And then you can have the highest confidence in the 100% chance of impact occurrence and you can measure it. So that's always important to, to, to remember that we need to measure also the impact in order to make it um, attractive for investors. And here are some examples. For Can example, go back one chart, Johannes? Yeah. Sorry. And the third party human confirmation, are you thinking of that like an auditor or certification kind of thing? Yeah. So okay. Okay. people are not related to the pharma and people who, who might be from the government and so on. So very much not related to the, the profit of the produce, okay. which is trying to be minted. Yeah. Okay, and, and my general sense is, is that the thought is anything that comes from a human is less to be trusted than anything that comes from a sensor. Exactly. It's, it's the way you're thinking about it. Okay. I, I'm, I'm too, I'm, I have that going around in my mind a little bit and I'm not quite there, but I, I, I just want to make sure I understood what you were saying here. Yeah, perfect. So I'll let you, can, I'll let you continue. Perfect, thank you. Um, so some examples. Um, for example, here we have a data point that says, okay, it look, looks quite rainy, right? Um, background is uh, location of the Google map, then the Google map zoom uh, matches the background and says, okay, yeah, it looks like that there. Um, then we have a data point and a photo where someone is picking up uh, something on the 17th of November, 2019. And then the EXIF metadata file also confirms that, okay, it was actually there. And um, what, I, what we're trying to show here is that pictures or this triangulation with Google Maps or satellite images can be a way of, um, of minting tokens because you improve the overall score. And now we we'll come to the confidence scoring, which is more for the math math interested people perhaps in the call where we say on the one hand side we have number of supporting data points the quality of the supporting data points the completeness and the consistency of the data points the machine-based data collection points third-party human confirmation so what i was trying to explain earlier that from auditors or from the government or from certifiers and third-party machine confirmation as kind of the, the final one and the, with the highest weight. And then we have different scores per category. And then you can either score one, which is the lowest one and three being the highest one. So I will not go through all the details here, but it just shows you in a mathematical approach of how to um, come to a final score, which then can be compared to other data points. And over time, this database will also grow and say, okay, if we get these kind of data points, we know that it must be true with a confidence of 99.5%. And you see also this weighted score. So you can also play around here with, with, uh, with the weights. We have decided to do it in, in such a fashion where, of course, third party. Oops, you honest, you froze, I think. Am I having that too? Everyone else? Have a freeze. Yes, we. Yeah, will. I don't hear him anymore. Yep. Okay. Oops. The bits from Vienna, man, <laughs> are working. You might have to. Uh... Okay, he got it off a of video at least. And of course, this is a point point at which bias enters the picture. So this is the most important aspect. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay, now we're you now froze. you're back. You froze for a while. Oh sorry. What was the last thing you heard? We were just talking about how you contrive all these scores and the fact that you could weight them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then we didn't miss anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm at university, but there's a lot of thunderstorms today in Vienna, so I'm not sure whether that can be 
mm. somehow in, in uh, making some interference to the internet. Sorry about that. No, no worries. Why, why don't you continue here before the thunderstorms get even worse? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I try to do my best. Um, all right, let me move on. So, so, so I think just a question I had there was, it sounds like you're advocating a probabilistic weighting as opposed to, I think a lot of us, you know, especially if you think about it from a DeFi, it's either here or there, it's a black and white type of thing. So you're saying probabilistic is probably a better way to trigger some sort of impact event. Yeah, because okay. we believe that different data points have different values and different weights. And uh, if, why should it be black and white if, if there's a possibility for a huge grayscale as we saw in the, uh, in the way you can verify information in the continuum of, of human versus machine. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, gray area in between, right? So we're trying to make sure that the token that is minted is true. And then also for the investor as, a, as, as, a, as an asset. But um, yeah, that's, that's kind of also the nature of it. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, I will try to speed up a little bit looking at the time. But um, yeah, this is basically the case study where we incentivize sustainable supply chain. So this is a fictive, um, a fictive case study where we try to showcase what we did with our approach. So Bamboozle is a furniture brand specializing in retail sale of sustainably produced bam bamboo furniture. Sustain chain is actually the bamboo furniture supplier needs upfront investment. And the sustainable agri-fund is an impact investor who wants to um, give capital to sustain chain at 7% interest. And then the goal of course is to get sustain chain uh, gets rewarded for sustainable production. Bamboozle promotes impact to customers and minimizes risk and supply chain and sustainable agri-fund makes financial return via investing in impact. So this is kind of the best case scenario. Um, then we have this kind of impact met metric selection uh, where you, we, we could look at fair wages, work hours, condition, packaging. We look at different data points that we can have from, from uh, sustain chain. And then we prove this data points. We do it via technology, perhaps as cameras, but also other means of, of uh, verifying and, and collecting the data, we verify it against uh, and against the model that I proposed, and uh, then we tokenize the data, and then we get also if sustain chain hits the target, from Google continues to order purchase orders, and a sustainable agri fund reduces the interest rate on the loan because it can actually take the value from the from the ESG or from the impact criteria, which was at uh, defined in the beginning. And um, yeah, I think it's uh, important here to understand that we can monetize these tokenized impact as an investment. And then we come to, and I will go through this just rather quickly. On the left hand side, we have different, the, the let's say, financial return oriented model, which is a traditional capitalistic one where you only look for the money and the profit, and that's the only thing you care about. And nowadays, uh, moves towards ESG and let's say uh, sustainability and responsibility and impact and philanthropy is on the right hand side who doesn't care about the uh, about the financial return but rather about the impact only and um, yeah this is just to keep in mind and uh, sorry if, if I go quickly now but I also want to leave some time for for questions and answers um, the interest bearing uh, performance-based model for pay for success is the one that we identified as being the, the one which we um, have in our analysis for our results. And the financial model is called interest-bearing pay for success model. And it works the following way. The payer or the uh, agrees to fund a verified impact if impact targets are achieved. Then the investor pays upfront to fund impact delivery. So this is the stage where the money gets unlocked. Then the implementer uses upfront funds to deliver impact within a defined time period. Then the verifier verifies data to ensure impact was achieved. The investor and payer receive impact data. And the payer pays back investor, investors principal plus interest if the impact was achieved. So this is really much focusing on impact 
and making sure the impact was achieved. And that only then unlocks the, the funds to go back back to um, back to the investor and also the implementer. And uh, yeah, I will not go through this. This would take uh, too much time now also to, uh, to, to, to explain this, but just in, a, in insurance models, impact insurance models might be also a way in the future to, to think about these financial models. Yeah? Um, that's just, so I mentioned it, but Let's uh, focus on, on, on what I presented today. And here we also just show uh, a model of how we came to the conclusion that the interest bearing pay for, for success model is the one that we seem to have the best score. So we looked at financial return, accessibility, re replicability, and regulatory feasibility. And we thought, okay, the interest bearing pay for success model is performing better than the other impact invest investment models. And finally, last but not least, I will uh, come to the final recommendation. So support the development of a democratized pay for success investment platform and promote the piloting of impact-based loans because this can be a game changer of how to create um, responsible and agricultural supply chains. All right, uh, a little bit more than 30 minutes. Sorry about that. Any questions from the group? Or any comments or anything unclear, which I should explain again? Yeah, Johannes, if you could go back a couple slides. Sure. Um, uh, probably one more. Uh, sorry, <laughs> towards the end, got to go towards the end. <laughs> Okay. One more. Actually, one more after that. There you go. Right there. Yeah. So, so, so two things. One is, it, it sounds like you're thinking because of all these different factors, doing some interest bearing pay for success model, that that's the one to kind of go for from a tokenization perspective. Um, were any of these a capital improvement model? I couldn't quite tell. And what I'm thinking of this is people, yeah, they get into yield farming with cryptocurrencies, but most of them are in for the capital appreciation. Bitcoin's going to go to the moon, blah, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. So I'm just wondering if, you, if you've spent some time on the capital appreciation aspects of this. So we believe the capital appreciation effect is actually in the fact that you invest in something that is, let's say, sustainable and good for the overall planet. Okay. <laughs> so that's the way we think about it. And uh, um, I think if you keep on doing what we're doing now, you will not have any any fields to or any way to to uh, to have sustainable agricultural supply chains because you simply um, destroy the way nature is currently, and then it cannot grow anything anymore because it's too hot or there's too little precipitation or you have other problems. So we actually need to shift to, to responsible agricultural supply chain in order to be also able to have value in the future. So if you ask me about the capital appreciation here, it's not maybe in the product itself in, in the way you say, okay. Uh, not one, it's one, not financial, it's uh, other places in the triple bottom line. Exactly, and that has an impact actually in the end on the value of the of the capital of the agricultural supply chain itself. Yeah. So okay. long term view, not not like your quarter to quarter thinking, which you have in let's say publicly traded companies, but rather long term looking. Okay, planet Earth is providing us with a habitable uh, planet, and we're not uh, using it appropriately and then actually in the long run maybe the kids of me or the grandkids of me might not be able to 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 live on planet earth anymore because it's too hot and then they might have to go to a different planet yeah yeah good thank you anybody else out there questions thoughts statement statements okay too <laughs> So my name as is non-controversial, Brett. 
I'm um, joking. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I kind of have a dry sense of humor, so you're gonna have to you're gonna have to give me a um, pass on that one. <laughs> so uh, yeah, and so um, and your presentation was um, you know, exhilarating to a large part, and I feel that the focus on investment is something that is appropriate in today's time with Brexit and um, how the central banks are working together and how investors are going to be able to profit and all of these things. And so it just raises an issue with me with regards to taxation. Have you given any thought to um, taxation? Um, taxation for the model, you mean? Well, I think if you have, um, you know, conglomerates, you know, I'm not trying to be controversial, <laughs> but if you have a conglomerate and you have various um, subsidiaries, you have in this new tax regime, essentially um, intra-firm taxes mm -hmm. that I feel can be solved with chain codes. So the tokenization, I think, is constantly introduced, but I think the chain codes or the smart contracts are really promising to deal with taxation. And have you given any thought to that? I mean, I'm not a taxation prof professional, but uh, um, by shedding more light into what was previously a black box and by tokenizing individual events, I believe that the taxation regime or taxation um, schemes can be applied much more fair because we now shed light into what was previously unknown or not very transparent. So by having this data layer, which provides the transparency into the different um, steps of the agriculture supply chain, I believe that the taxation system can then check, okay, at this location, it was changing perhaps a country, at this location it was perhaps, or at this step it was changing not from one company within the company to another company. Um, so you can right. look and, at and these so, different so, stages, yeah? Yeah, so let me, let me just stay specific because we're talking about tax regimes and I'm talking about corporate tax. And so if I have an intra firm, let's say, let's say I have a farm in Mexico and they're able to produce something for less than they are able to produce in Michigan, for instance, there's going to be a taxable event from one intra firm to the next. And I feel that the chain code it could essentially potentially well, that's my project, essentially. But um, that is what I was thinking you could possibly have an interest in also exploring. The intra firms, like in, in, you know, like you have one corporation and they have little corporations, they have little companies, little intra firms, you know, within their larger corporation and to be able to manage all of those taxable events is where I was going. Yeah, I think with tokenization, you can make that measurable and through tokenization and the smart contracts, you can even not only think about what I was trying to explain today, but also, also about payment processes, tax processes. You can right. actually load that up in the smart contract and say, if it leaves this company and goes to this other intra company, then this needs to be executed or released in terms of payments or, or authorship. And this can be done through blockchain and tokenization. That's the beauty of it. Right. Thank you. Good. You're welcome. Good. Anybody else out there before we uh, close up shop here for today? We have eight more minutes, right, Tom? <laughs> we'll close up shop early if there's no more questions out there. Going once, going yes. twice. Comments, critique, feedback, anything. <laughs> yeah. Okay, beautiful. Well, we're going to close up shop here. Johannes, thank you very much for uh, sharing your thoughts here and your research and uh, your sponsored research, actually. And uh, 
given us some ideas that we can use to implement in future projects as we're going forward here. Uh, there. Uh, folks that are listening and recording, thanks for listening here. Thanks for folks that, that participated uh, live uh, here. And we'll look forward to regathering in uh, two weeks. So enjoy the rest of the day, everybody, wherever you are in the world. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you.